Welcome to Bear in Mind. I'm your host, Chancellor Bob Birdall. We're coming to you from our TV studio on the UC Berkeley campus, where we're joined by a small audience of students, faculty, and staff. Today's program is both the first of the new school year and the first to be videotaped for UC TV. On this edition, we'll be talking to Dean Ralph Hexter of the College of Letters and Science, psychology professor Martin Covington, and graduate student Kristen Reed, just back from a summer in Angola. So stay tuned for this edition of Bear in Mind. Although the College of Letters and Science is only one of 14 colleges on the, and professional schools on the campus of the University of California, it is by far the largest. Uh, with over half of the faculty of the entire university, uh, three quarters of the undergraduates, nearly half of the PhD students, graduate students on the campus, the College of Letters and Science rather typifies Ber Berkeley and, and is representative of what Berkeley is. And today we are pleased to be joined by Dean Ralph Hexter, uh, who is the Executive Dean of the College of Letters and Science and the Dean of Humanities on this campus. Welcome, Ralph. Good to be here. Um, what's the new school year like? I mean, uh, are you excited? What's happening? I'm very excited. Um, we have a good team of deans, uh, and I think as always, leading the college. And um, it's invigorating to see the students come back to campus and fill the classrooms. Um, I'm looking forward to doing a little teaching myself. Not all the deans can do that all the time, um, but it's that wonderful feeling, that freshness in the, in the air, and there are plenty of challenges. Well, tell me, Ralph, uh, answer a question that a lot of parents ask me and a lot of prospective students ask me, uh, and, and that is, you know, why should I take these classes in letters and science? Will that help me get a job? Uh, isn't, isn't it more important for me to m major in one of the professional schools or in engineering or some technology major that will translate into employment? Uh, what does an English major do? Uh, well, let, let me talk to those, those parents through you, Bob. Uh, you know, I think that in today's economic world, we see it all around us, um, our f careers are going to be filled with change. And nothing can prepare one better for, for that than the broad preparation of a liberal arts education. Um, a liberal arts education, and certainly we, we embody this at the, the College of Letters and Science, involves a concentration in a major where every student learns the rigors of disciplinary thinking and what I think is very, very important that what you learn the first time around needs to be corrected and made more precise as you dig ever more deeply, as well as breadth through the distribution requirements. And what we're preparing students for is really to embark in whatever field uh, on, a, on a life of, of learning and careers that will require not only the skills they've honed in our college, communication both written and oral, critical thinking, uh, analysis, uh, reflection, but to learn how to learn, since I dare say many of them will have to retool as we see so many of the, the citizens of the Bay Area doing just now. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the, the programs you're offering this year? Uh, I know we have a large number of freshman seminars, for example, and, uh, and you're teaching a freshman seminar. Yes on the Peloponnesian War, I gather. That's right. Uh, tell us a little bit about that seminar, what you expect out of it, and, and what, what, what the Peloponnesian War discussion uh, will yield. As we have entered into a new time of war, I felt that our students ought to have the opportunity to read the reflections of this keen analytical mind as he chronicles how Athens and Sparta and all their allies jockeyed for power and also how so many unexpected things came along and um, spelled defeat when victory seemed assured and sometimes the other way and how the external policies were so dependent on the internal policies and the, the personalities of some of the major figures, Pericles, Cleon. 
I, what will the discussions be? I'm not aiming at bringing out modern day parallels, but I expect they will leap off the page. Mm -hmm. So I can't wait, actually it will begin this afternoon, to meet the 15 students who will take this class, introduce them to Thucydides, and then next week um, have them come back with answers to the questions I've suggested for them to help them mm -hmm. in their reading. And there will never be a dull moment, I know that. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ralph. We really appreciate your being on Bear in Mind. Thank you, Bon. That was Dean uh, Ralph Hexter, Dean of Letters and Science uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, on Bear in Mind. Thanks, Ralph. Our next guest, Professor Martin Covington of the Psychology Department, is a teacher who loves to teach and more than that, loves to learn and to study how it is that people do learn. Over a long and distinguished career, he's received many awards, including appointment to the Presidential Chair in Undergraduate Education. Professor Covington is using his appointment and his research to educate other faculty on how to encourage the love of learning among students. Professor Covington, welcome to Bear in Mind. Thank you, it's a delight to be here. Tell me about how you got interested in this, in this area of, of research. Years ago when we were doing research on teaching thinking strategies to children, that is the cognitive or intellectual side of the process, we actually achieved considerable success in improving these skills. But it was clear to us that they were not always willing to use them. And they didn't recognize when it was important to use them. And that draws on the issue of motivation mm -hmm. and the willingness to learn. And so that became our primary topic, which turned out to be a much more difficult uh, issue than just teaching some of the thought strategies for learning. Well, tell me about the outcomes of, of your uh, inquiry into this area mm -hmm. and, uh, and how it's affected how you teach or how you help others teach? Basically, the research in this field that we've contributed to here at Berkeley suggests traditionally two kinds of reasons for learning. There are those reasons associated with approaching success and those associated with avoiding failure. Mm -hmm. The former, of course, empowers people. It beguiles them. It draws them toward the majesty of the topic, the intrinsic rewards that come from curiosity, satisfaction. It relates to occupational goals as well. Uh, the kinds of outcomes there are all, almost all positive. We learn quicker. We learn in greater depth and understanding. We're able to retain information longer and apply it in an overreaching situation beyond its original scope. With fear of failure, the strategy is defensive. That is, people are trying to avoid failure or a bad grade what's behind failure, because it isn't just the act of failure, we've all been disappointed in life over various things, but it's the implication for students in particular that they lack ability. That's the reason for the failure. Hence, they lack self-worth, because in our society, we spend a lot of time mm -hmm. making the point that we're only as good as our ability to often compete and the ability to succeed in competitive situations. Therefore, there's a real risk so that in classrooms, learning can be an ordeal for students. Mm -hmm. And so many of them use defensive strategies so that uh, if they cannot uh, necessarily avoid failure, they ironically enough set up situations that encourage the failure to occur, what they're trying to avoid, but it is without the stigma of inability. Such things as procrastination, mm -hmm. in which they can argue persuasively sometimes that my failure is not a function of inability, but of not having enough time to work or having put things off. Mm -hmm. Having goals that are too high, are too uh, irrational, so that nobody could succeed in that situation, so I cannot be blamed myself for failing as well. Now those are strategies that detract from learning, mm -hmm. from the love of learning, and the valuing of it. And so these are some of the kinds of dynamics that uh, faculty and students wittingly and sometimes unwittingly face whenever courses are taught. Mm -hmm. And do faculty inadvertently 
play into some of the negative uh, motivations uh, uh, and, and, and thus contribute to the problem? Uh, if they're not aware of, of this, are there ways in which you're working with faculty to, to help them uh, encourage the, the, the positive and the love of learning? Precisely. Uh, one, of the, one of the traps that faculty we all fall into is that when students are pursuing some of these defensive strategies, it's very easy to charge that they're not interested, even lazy, unmotivated, although they're highly motivated, but for the wrong reasons. So it's not an issue of a lack of motivation. And so we sometimes interpret these kinds of activities that are defensive in nature as something inherent in the student, whereas if we understand these dynamics, we can put at least a better cast on it in terms of looking for ways to solve it. And this gets to your second question. Mm -hmm. In my introductory psychology course, which I've taught each year, with usually five to 600 students, first of all, we try to set an alliance with students. That is, a frank and open discussion, as we're having right now, mm -hmm. in which students come to understand the role of faculty, their responsibilities, faculty understanding these kinds of issues that face students, the obstacles such as fear of failure and the like, and then craft some kind of implied contract that really spells out students' responsibilities to be the ultimate meaning makers in a class and the faculty's responsibilities for helping them become those kinds of self-generating, self-relevant people. Next, we try to encourage students in a sense of clarity about what it is we require we have very high standards. Mm -hmm. We present the criteria by which we will judge, say, essays, work that they turn in, so that uh, they get a sense for what it means intuitively to become psychologically minded as a professional. And then they practice these strategies, and they test their own ideas and those of their peers against these criteria. And then ultimately, as the course goes on, we ask the students to create their own criteria we fade ours out because ultimately they've got to go out in the real world mm -hmm. and create criteria as parents, as employers, mm -hmm. as just people. Then finally, in giving the letter grade in the course, which is a very fearful kind of process as we've implicated already throughout the semester, we make it clear that that is, the, is based on a compilation, an aggregate of all of these other performances and students will acquire uh, grade credits as they go. They know how much they need, the higher the grade they want, the more they have to work, and the higher the standards. Mm -hmm. So that any of them can succeed because our standards relate to competency. Mm -hmm. My graduate students and I spend a lot of time figuring out together what counts as competency in terms of the students behaviors and then we share that with the students. Mm -hmm. So there's no particular mystery, mm -hmm. although education is ultimately a mystery, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be a fearsome kind of mystery. One of the things that Dean Hexter said was that the purpose of a liberal arts education in large part is to learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I've always thought that's a very wonderful definition of this. A and your formula of finding something of interest in in a subject that may not of itself be interesting to you. Is that part of this process of learning how to learn? I think it is. Yeah. Learning how to learn and being willing to continue to learn is crucial. For those people who are primarily interested in performance and in grades per se mm -hmm. and the achievement side, which is very crucial, obviously, it's important to note that the one strongest predictor of a variety of socially valued success yardsticks for the CEO and the business person yearly income. For the professors, the number of times their work is cited in the literature. For students, GPA. That really disparate and broad category of, of uh, success uh, measures is predicted best by the individual's willingness to continue to learn, to improve, to reach out and understand, and uh, do that for a lifetime. There's a second factor involved in that, and that's being cooperative. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that the, uh, 
the personality attribute that we call competitiveness, if we want to think of that as an internal uh, value that the person holds, and it's a consistent value, that tends to be negatively correlated with all these criteria. That is, the That's more competitive one is probably more abrasive, more uh, difficult to, to approach, uh, less giving, uh, then income is less, citations are fewer, <laughs> and grade point is lower. That's very interesting. Um, we have always argued that competition is important, but more as a subject matter. That is to learn about my uh, abilities, uh, my comfort zone. Do I want to go into a profession such as the military, which is a hierarchical structure? So you move from one rank to another. There are fewer and fewer people chosen. Uh, does that suit my, my uh, characteristics personally? Uh, that's all to be distinguished from competition as a m way of motivating people. Mm -hmm. it, it's self-informing rather than s exclusionary. Well, this is a w wonderfully interesting subject, and uh, we could go on uh, at great length. I want to thank you, Professor Covington, for the very interesting work you're doing and the contribution that it makes to the campus, and today for being on Bear in Mind. A delight. Thank you. Go Bears. That was Professor. That was Professor Martin Covington of the Psychology Department and holder of the Presidential Chair in Undergraduate Education. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. At some point in our educational experience, each of us has been asked to write or to talk about what we did on our summer vacation. Uh, that's a common question. However, our next guest, Kristen Reed, has a very uncommon answer for she spent her summer vacation studying the impact of the oil industry on Angola's natural resources and people. Kristen, thank you for joining us on Bear in Mind today. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Well, you're a PhD student in environmental science policy and management here at Berkeley. Uh, what drew you to this area of, of research and, and study uh, in the first place? Well, I've always been interested in the interactions between human rights and the environment. So I'm very interested in how natural resource dependent people are able to control and access the natural resources that they depend upon for a living. So um, originally I became very interested in this issue within Nigeria in the Delta region where oil production was hindering people's access to lo local resources through agriculture and fisheries. The environment had become so polluted there that people were unable to carry out their livelihoods. So uh, Nigeria is the first largest oil producer in sub-Saharan Africa. And Angola is the second, yet most people haven't heard much about Angola's oil production. Half of all Angola's oil production goes to the United States. And the, the large problem with this is that um, the, the revenues that are generated from oil production are not going back into environmental protection. They're not going back into social services. So this has been a larger level uh, impact of oil production in Angola. Has it, what has been the effect on the indigenous people and, and the environment in which they're working? And how, how, do, how is outside of that oil production, which is largely done by Western uh, transnational corporations, uh, what, what is the role of the Angolan people? Are they benefiting from the, uh, from, from this resource that they have, and, uh, and what has been the impact on their livelihood generally? Unfortunately, there have been a number of oil spills up in the northern region of Angola, and so a lot of the fishermen have lost their access to the fisheries, lost their ability to make a livelihood, and some of them have been compensated for that by the large transnational corporations. Unfortunately, it's only been about 10% of them who have been compensated for their losses. And furthermore, the women who also generate income based upon marketing and sales of fish 
have not been compensated whatsoever. So this has been a large impact on the economy of the northern region. Mm -hmm. uh, your inquiry here, uh, obviously the oil companies must have known about your being there. <laughs> uh, how, did they, how did they receive you and uh, did they welcome this kind of inquiry? Well, uh, some of them were actually very welcoming in terms of giving me some of the environmental data that is available because they're careful not to have everything uh, in Angola go the way that Nigeria's oil production has gone in terms of pollution. Yet, on the other hand, it's very difficult to know how accurate this data is because uh, there has been little, very little independent uh, data comparison um, in, in the way of environmental uh, testing for toxins and, uh, and heavy metals. So it's very difficult to know um, how accurate this data is. This has been a, a problem in Angola. But, um, but on the other hand, a lot of people, you know, I handed out my business card and a lot of people were a bit worried to see that I was a Berkeley student because <laughs> Berkeley has uh, quite a reputation for environmental activism, which mm -hmm. I was quite proud of. But uh, some, some did Probably squirm a bit. Probably one of the you selected Berkeley. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you, you mentioned in Nigeria and the comparison with Nigeria. There have been uh, a lot of allegations about human rights violations associated with the uh, extraction of oil from Nigeria uh, and the granting of those concessions. Have similar things happened in Angola uh, as well? Well, in terms of the larger scale macroeconomic problems associated with Nigeria, in terms of the, uh, the monies from oil production not making it down to local level social services and these sorts of aspects, it is very similar. There, there has been a lot of um, corruption and loss of these oil revenues. In the past five years, $4 billion in oil revenues have gone missing in Angola. So you do see these four billion? four billion dollars over the past five years. That's a lot of money it to lot. Uh, <laughs> lose track of. Absolutely, and in fact, all of uh, the UN estimates that all of Angola's humanitarian needs could be fulfilled by for for an entire year could be fulfilled by one month's worth of Angola's oil revenues, but it's not making it there, um, and this has been a major problem for Angola. But on the the lower level community side, and this is what I'm interested in studying further, you don't see the sort of widespread pollution um, because most of Angola's production is done offshore, which okay. is a very different process. Mm -hmm. the, the tides and the waves wash a lot of the pollution out, so it's very difficult to know, it's very difficult to do mm -hmm. the type of testing that you can do on land-based oil production. You can see a spill and you can yeah. test an area and you can see that it's actually having an impact, mm -hmm. a negative impact on the local agriculture on, or, on, uh, or on health human mm -hmm. health. But in terms of fisheries, it's a bit more difficult to determine whether it's the pollution that's causing crashes in fish stocks or whether it's widespread overfishing, which is a problem worldwide. One of the purposes of your study is obviously to develop recommendations for public policy uh, because that's part of the, the program that you're in. What, uh, what conclusions have you reached, uh, or at least tentative conclusions <laughs> have you reached, with regard to changes in policy that would be important to make and that would be doable? Well, U.S. foreign policy plays a very strong role in Angola. And one of the initiatives that's been started by a number of uh, nonprofit and non-governmental organizations is the Publish What You Pay campaign. And this campaign mandates that all transnational corporations actually publish how much they're paying in taxes and royalties and signing bonuses over to oil producing governments, for example, Angola. So then we would actually know how much Angola is receiving in terms of oil revenues, taxes, royalties, etc. And we would know how much of that should go into the budget for social spending and things like this. And, and we would know exactly how much is missing because this $4 billion is just a, a, mm -hmm. an estimate. So that's to put not pressure on the oil companies so much as it is on the governments 
to be more transparent in, uh, in how they employ the, the resources mm -hmm. that they're deriving. To do both, actually, because transparency and accountability are on linked together sides. intricately on both sides. And there has been sort of a complicity between the transnational oil companies and the Angolan government, because both sides benefit from keeping their practices a little bit, you know, shady. <laughs> uh, do you, do you uh, think that this is likely to come about? I think it will be a very difficult battle. Uh, in fact, BP, though, one of the, the larger oil producers, did initiate a transparency movement. Now, the Angolan government got wind of it, and they said, well, you won't be producing any oil in Angola if you'll be publishing your figures. So they backed away from that quite quickly. What's going to be necessary is that the consortium of, uh, consortium of oil companies in Angola and in other, company, uh, other countries around the world these companies must get together and actually all of them publish their figures during the exact same time and, and say exactly what they're giving to each country. And then the pressure will be coming from both sides. So you need to break through at least in one place before you can get that, that effect throughout. Uh, Absolutely. Oil. These, these oil companies are very competitive amongst each other. Mm -hmm. So just one oil company publishing its figures mm -hmm. that could be detrimental to their business is what they say. I see. Are you going back to Angola? That's uh, my plan. Okay. <laughs> Next summer or? I'm hoping to start my, my graduate research in, in the summer. So of you were doing a kind of an initial survey before you did uh, before, and so you'll be digging in uh, even deeper or drilling deeper perhaps <laughs> is the right, the right phrase. Definitely. This is really fascinating. Well, thank you very, very much, Kristen. This was Kristen Reed uh, from uh, a graduate student doing a very interesting uh, thesis on the impact of oil on the Angolan uh, economy and environment. Our PhD student in environmental science policy and management, thank you for being on Bear in Mind, Kristen. Thank you for having me. Thank you.